I'm Arnie Gunderson from Fairwinds, and what follows is the video that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and the nuclear industry really don't want you to see. Dave Lockbaum from Union of Concerned Scientists and I gave a presentation at the Boston Public Library about two and a half weeks ago. It was sponsored by several groups, including C10, and uh, it discusses how Fukushima can happen anywhere in the world. It's not just a Japanese problem, but in fact could happen in the United States, Germany, again in Japan, or anywhere there's a nuclear reactor. We talk about what the real root causes of the Fukushima event really were. Now, there's a sequence on here with his, which is the explosion at, um, at Fukushima slowed down. And I have to thank one of the viewers of our website, Jeff Sutton, who, who put that time-lapse sequence together. And uh, I really appreciate it, Jeff. Thank you. Well, buckle up your seatbelts and uh, enjoy the, uh, the presentation at the Boston Public Library. Thanks. Uh, good evening. I appreciate C10 for hosting this event and you all for turning out. For those of you who don't know me, my name is David Lockbaum. For those of you who do know me, my name's also David Lockbaum. For some reason, it works out the same either way. I'm going to start out, Arnie and I are going to present what happened at Fukushima and why those vulnerabilities plague U.S. reactors, Seabrook, Pilgrim, Vermont Yankee. The type of reactor really didn't matter. The, the primary cause at Fukushima would have knocked down any one of our plants. So it's not a direct problem with GE reactors or boiling water reactors. It's a problem with nuclear reactors that we need to address. The, there were six reactors at Fukushima. Three of, the, three of them were operating at the time. Three of them were shut down for refueling, scheduled refueling at the time. Boiling water reactor on the left-hand side, the, the nuclear fuel is inside a reactor vessel. The heat from splitting atoms is used to warm water that's flowing upwards through the reactor core. That heat causes the water to boil. The steam leaves the reactor vessel and is carried through piping to a turbine that's connected to a generator. The spinning turbine generates electricity that goes out on the wires to consumers down the line. The steam leaving the turbine is then passed into a condenser, a large metal barn, basically. In this case, seawater was passed through tubes inside that condenser to cool the steam down, convert it back into water. The condensed water was then sent back to the reactor and used over and over again to remove steam, make steam, and spin the turbine. The warmed seawater was returned to the Sea of Japan for further use. This shows, this is called a simplified diagram, but it looks a little more complicated than the last one. The red portions show the steam lines going from the reactor vessel to the turbine, as the, as the earlier, the even simpler diagram showed. The light blue lines, cyan lines, show the, the water going back from the condenser to the reactor vessel. This will come in more important in just a second. Two seconds. When the earthquake occurred, these reactors, because Japan's kind of susceptible to earthquakes, those reactors automatically shut down within seconds when they detected ground motion caused by the earthquake. So within seconds of the earthquake or sensing that, the control rods inserted into the reactor core stopped the nuclear chain reaction and turned the reactors off. About a minute later, the turbine tripped. There's no more, not enough steam going through the turbine anymore, so the turbine tripped. The earthquake knocked out the electrical grid, the normal source of power to the, to the plant. When the turbine tripped, the generator tripped, that meant it wasn't producing any electricity for the plant either. So the earthquake and the turbine trip took away the normal source of power for the plant. This shows a close-up look. The red line shows the steam line going from the reactor vessel to the first valve that's inside the reactor containment building. The loss of power caused those valves to fail safe. The fail-safe position for those valves was closed, which meant the steam was no longer going down the pipe, or at least no further than that closed valve. In that case, you have steam still being produced by the decay heat being put off by the fuel in the reactor core, so you had to have something to deal with that energy that's still being produced. At Unit 1, which was different than Units 2 and 3, Unit 1 was the oldest of the reactors at Fukushima, that plant had what was called a isolation condenser, which is shown on the left. It's a big tank of water. 
that has tubes that flow through it. it. Actually, there's two tanks of water, each with tubes flowing through it. Shortly into the accident, whoops, I'll step up. The little valve circled in yellow automatically opened because the pressure inside the reactor vessel was rising too high to protect the reactor vessel from bursting like a balloon or the piping from bursting due to too much pressure. The high pressure automatically opened that valve, allowed steam from the reactor to flow through the tubes inside this large tank of water where it got cooled back down into water and then gravity drained that water back into the reactor vessel. So that isolation condenser controlled the pressure inside the reactor vessel and also controlled makeup. There was no steam leaving. It was all being reused. So the amount of water in the reactor core, reactor vessel was remaining the same. The operators about 11 minutes later turned that system off as at Three Mile Island, you turn off emergency safety systems, you, you're basically toying with the devil and the devil wins. But they turned the, the safety system off, they closed that valve 11 minutes after it opened because the temperature of the water inside the reactor vessel was cooling down at 300 degrees an hour. It's a big piece of metal and there's limits on how fast it heats up or cools down because you don't want, you want to control the expansion and contraction so it doesn't break. It was cooling down faster than they wanted it to, well above the 100 degree an hour limit, so they turned the safety system off. When they did that, there's, they lost a way to handle the pressure buildup inside the reactor vessel, so the reactor vessel finds its own way. It uses some safety relief valves that discharge the steam to a different place that's called the torus or suppression chamber. In this design, it's a large metal ring, looks like a donut made out of metal, nuclear-sized, that holds about two and a half million gallons of water. The steam from the reactor vessel is then routed down into this large body of water. That's controlling the pressure, but with no makeup, and there's absolutely no makeup available for this type of plant. The, ultimately, as you discharge that steam into the torus, the water level inside the reactor vessel kept dropping. As the steam left, the, there's less and less water inside the reactor vessel. It started out with about 15 feet of water, normal water level to where the top of the core was. It was just a matter of time before, it's like, I called it the nuclear wick. They, they lit the wick on a nuclear candle. It just took a time for that to melt down. During normal operation, the temperature inside the fuel clad is up to, or inside the fuel pellet, is up to about 1600 degrees. That heat drops as it moves through the, the gap between the fuel pellets and the fuel rods. Fuel rods are, are 15 foot long hollow tubes of metal with peas, fuel pellets stacked in them like peas in a pod and it welded at top and bottom. Sorry about that, Rob. The, as the fuel temperature inside the fuel goes through that gap that goes through the metal cladding and reaches the water, it drops down to about 560 degrees on the surface of the fuel cladding. As the water level drops lower and lower, the water's doing less and less cooling, less and less removal of that heat. As a result, the fuel pellets warmed up, the fuel cladding warmed up. As the temperature of the fuel cladding exceeded 1800 degrees Fahrenheit, you start getting a chemical reaction between the water and the zirconium metal that produced a large amount of hydrogen. A very large amount of hydrogen is, fall, is created. Hydrogen is has a lot of good properties, but it also has a lot of negative properties. Anybody remembers the, the graph Zeppelin, the Hindenburg? Um, when hydrogen ignites, it, it burns very rapidly. There's a system installed at these plants to deal with that, to prevent that. There was a lot of talk about the hardened wet, 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 there was, it looks better in print. There was a lot of talk about a hardened vent. I'll just leave out the tough word. This diagram shows that hardened vent. It's located on the left-hand side of the screen. The, the turbine is on the right-hand side. The little building that surrounds what looks like an inverted light bulb is the reactor building. The way it's supposed to work, the way it was designed, was that as steam carried hydrogen down into the torus, it, the hydrogen bubbled up through the water and collected in the airspace above the torus, the water in the torus. There's a valve that can be opened that allows that airspace, which includes hydrogen and radioactive materials, to go out through an eight inch diameter pipe directly out to an exhaust in, in the roof of the building. It passes through the reactor building, but it's supposed to be on the inside of that pipe where it goes out through the exhaust, the chimney basically. That didn't work for some reason. 
The operators manually open that, that valve because the valve is motor controlled and without electricity a motor operated valve doesn't move so they had to go down and crank open that vent in an area that's very hot, very dark, and very nasty. It took them a while to do that. It, it took longer than they would have liked. During normal operation, the, the yellow circle surrounds a filter system that's used to filter the radioactive releases from the plant. There's a charcoal filter and a HEPA filter that reduces the amount of radioactivity that's vented out the stack. During accident conditions, there's another filter system that's supposed to do the same thing for anything that collects inside the reactor building. However, both of those systems need electricity to work. Neither of those systems work when you don't have electricity. For reasons unknown, but hard to deny, the hydrogen got into the reactor building and then blew up. Not once, not twice, not three times, but four times. We're not sure exactly how it happened in any of those times. It wasn't supposed to be in those buildings. There are no detectors to detect hydrogen in those buildings other than missing walls and roofs, perhaps. But at some point on Saturday morning, the March 12th, Unit 1 blew up. The hydrogen collected and detonated, blew out the sides of the building and the roof. The, the schematic on the right shows the Hatch plant in Georgia, which is very similar to the, that plant and many other plants in the United States. Up to the point of the spent fuel pool, it, the concrete walls withstood the hydrogen explosion. From that point on, it's a sheet metal siding, not unlike a Sears storage shed. Again, I have nothing against Sears or their storage sheds, but it's really not a place to store nuclear waste. The picture on the right, or left, kind of shows, proves that out. That's Unit 1 reactor building at Fukushima with the upper parts of the walls and the roof taken away by the explosion. Okay, that's your turn. We're going to flip. All right. Um, unit 1 was the oldest plant and it had this isolation condenser that Dave was talking about. Um, let me step back a little bit though. When uranium splits, 95% of the heat comes from the splitting of uranium. But 5% comes from these pieces that are left over, they're called radioactive daughter products. Now, 5% <clears throat> doesn't sound like a lot, but each of the reactors at Fukushima were producing around two and a half million horsepower. So 5% of that is still 125,000 horsepower of heat that you had to get rid of after the plant was shut down. And those horses were in a room that was 12 by 12 by about as high as this. So put 120,000 horses in a, room, <clears throat> in a room like that, and you can imagine they're going to churn out a lot of heat that has to be, that has to be dissipated. Um, Unit 1 had the isolation condenser, which is really interesting. It's, it's almost identical to a Model T, um, the way the Model T was cooled. Um, the Model T had a gravity-fed cooling system on it. Um, unit 2 and 3 had something called the RCIC uh, turbine, and that's the, that's the first piece of, uh, of information here. Um, this is kind of neat. It, uh, it uses the steam from the nuclear reactor to spin a turbine. <clears throat> Here's the turbine. So just like in Unit 1, there's all this heat-producing steam. The isolation valves were closed, so the steam wasn't going anywhere. And the turbine spun, which in turn turned a pump. So there was no electricity required to turn that pump. It was using the decay heat steam, which is kind of neat, except, you guessed it, the valves that worked that system required electricity. So even though the pump and the turbine were, would, have, would have gone on for days, when they lost the control of the valves, the RCIC turbine stopped. Okay, next slide. So what does that do? The fuel gets hot. Um, this is up on our website. There's a, uh, a friend of mine. I had a piece of nuclear fuel um, empty. That, um, that I was given when I was in the industry. And it's made of a thing called zircaloy. And zircaloy is really unique um, in that it does what Dave said. It, uh, it can spontaneously um, oxidize.